he says give it a few minutes, so we'll give him a few minutes. Okay. All right, let's start. We'll have prayer. Miss Catherine, do you mind offering the prayer, please? Dear God, we come before you this morning just thanking you for all the many blessings, for your love and the love of your son, Jesus. I just pray that you'd be with all the sick that was mentioned here today. Touch them in a, a mighty way, Lord, and just give us the peace. Give us your peace to help us through this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, so we are going to talk about the daughters of Sarah. So go back to our main scripture, which is 1 Peter 3. Today we're going to concentrate on verses 5 and 6 and 7, but first off we're going to read verse 5 and 6. So 1 Peter 3, verse 5 and verse 6. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So we're concentrating on this passage right here that says, You have become her children, Sarah's children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. All right, ladies. I am the daughter of Joanne Carol Brockman Wooders and Glenn David Wooders. Roger is the son of Maggie Lee Austin Leonard and Raymond Glenn Leonard. We know that physically we have mothers and fathers. So what does this mean that we can be Sarah's daughters? We know that the Jewish people back in Jesus' day could uh, look back at their lineage and connect their lineage all the way back to Abraham and all the way back to Sarah. And those are the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. We know that all of us sitting around this table are Gentiles. We are not Jews. Physically, we are not Sarah's children, okay? So we can become Sarah's children, Sarah's daughters, only in a spiritual way. Look with me, please, at Genesis 17, verse one, verse 4 and verse 5. Genesis 17, verse 1, verse 4 and verse 5. We become Abraham's offspring and also Sarah's offspring in a different way. This is the promise that God made to Abram when he was 99 years old looking at verse 1, verse 4, and verse 5. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. Verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. The first line of verse 6 says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. So here we see the first promise that God made to Abram about offspring and many nations coming from him. Did you know that you and I, and what an awesome thought, that we as Christians are part of this promise that God made to Abram. Is that not an awesome thought, that you are part of that fulfillment of that promise that God made to Abram? Look with me at Romans chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 11, verse 16, and verse 17. Romans chapter 4. And we're going to look at three verses there, verse 11, verse 16, and verse 17. Romans chapter 4. I turned to chapter 11. That won't work. Chapter 4, verse 11 reads, And he received the sign of circumcision, this is Abraham, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, 
which he had while uncircumcised, listen to this, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Look at verse 16 and 17. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So here we see in this passage that the children of Abraham are Gentiles as well as the Hebrew people. And when God said, I will make you a father of many nations, that was a four uh, coloring of the fact that God was going to eventually accept Gentiles into his chosen people. We are, the, uh, we are God's Israel today. God's Israel back in the Old Testament times was the Hebrew people. But today it includes all of us who are Christians. Look with me also at Galatians 3, verse 7 and 8. Galatians 3, we're going to look at verse 7 and verse 8. Galatians 3, 7 and 8. Get my Bible turned. Okay. Verse 7 says, Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. Okay. So here we see that this is how we become Abraham's descendants. This is also how we become Sarah's descendants. Now if you look in those passages that we read in the Romans passage and in the Galatians passage, you will see that they are um, conditional. Okay, In the Romans passage, all who believe in the Galatians passage those who are of faith. Now look in 1 Peter 3, verse 6. Okay. In this passage we read about Sarah. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if, you see that little word, if, if, you are her children, if, it's conditional, if you do what is right and without fear. Okay, in the New American Standard, it reads, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. In the New King James, it reads, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. In the NIV, it reads, if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. And in the ESV, it reads, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. All right, do you remember last week when we looked back at Sarah's life? What are some of the things that she had to deal with? Number one, was she, were, was she married to Abram when God came to him and says, pick up everything and leave? And go to land, and I'm not telling you which land. I'll show it to you when you get there. Yes. Number two, was she asked to be called Abram's sister so that uh, the, the foreign people, the foreign kings wouldn't kill him? Yes. And what did that entail? Her being taken by the king to become part of his harem, mm -hmm. okay? Leaving her family, leaving her customs, leaving her husband, leaving everything. How many times did that happen? Twice. Twice. Uh, number three, or number four, um, was she the mother of Isaac? Not at that time, but later. Later, she was the mother of Isaac. And what did God ask Abraham to do to Isaac? Kill him. Kill him. Sacrifice. Sacrifice him. And you recall that we mentioned how they went at least three days journey away and she was left at home. And what would have happened if, you know, they had been killed 
while they were out or whatever, she was left. And we also talked about when Abraham fought the kings and she was left at home. He was trying to save Lot. He did save Lot. But she was left at home. And could she have been thinking, what's going to happen to me if he goes into this battle and he does not win? You know, So she had some major trying situations in her life that she had to be faithful and she had to mm, not be fearful, shall we say? Trust. 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 That's a good word. Okay. It's hard to trust all the time in situations. It is. I mean, it's, it's, it's just hard. That's it is. True. It is. And especially when you're not the one doing the leading because you're kind of along for the ride, just like the passenger in the car who's not driving but sitting there. You're at the mercy of the judgment of the person who's driving. And in this situation, Abraham was the leader of their family, and she had to follow along, and she did. And that's what we've been talking about. She let him be the leader. But God took care of her in all those situations, and she had to have that trust. So look with me in your book. So on page 119, I'd like to read a little bit off of the book. Um, at the bottom of that page, there's a quote. And this is about how far does obedience go when one is married to an unbeliever? Because we're talking about the way that we live as Christian wives if our husbands are unbelievers. It says, a Christian wife's deference to her pagan husband cannot extend to adopting his religion, for this would be a failure to do good. If she does good by maintaining her allegiance to God, even while showing deference to her husband, there is always a possibility, however remote, that her husband may not understand or tolerate her alien religion, and that consequently her freedom or safety may be jeopardized. Hence the ominous words of comfort with which Peter's advice to wives concludes, and let nothing frighten you, literally not fearing any terror. Now remember the context of this writing. Peter is writing to these Christians because they are going to start um, being persecuted. And we read last week from a different commentator about how Nero would be soon coming to Rome to rule in Rome and how Nero really persecuted the Christians. Matter of fact, he burned Rome to the ground and blamed it on the Christians. And that's in your history books. But um, anyway, so this Christian woman who's married to an unbeliever, a non-Christian, even if she's doing everything right, might still be persecuted by her husband. Christian ladies, even if we're living and doing everything right, we're still going to probably suffer hardships in our lives. Maybe cancer like Miss Catherine went through. Maybe a bad car wreck like I know a faithful gospel preacher who got paralyzed in a, in a, in a wreck. Um, maybe death of a spouse and we're left a widow at a very young age. Um, maybe our child has cancer and dies. Mm. Or, I mean, things good, bad things happen to good people. God never said he would put you in a bubble and nothing bad would ever happen to you. But he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And even in the bad situations, he's there with you and he will help you through them. And so in this situation, maybe it might not turn out the way you wanted it to, but we know that God will be with us. And so therefore that phrase, without any fear or without being frightened by any fear. But my question is, does Peter say that we cannot be afraid? Is that what this passage is saying? Does Peter say that being fearful is sin? Is that what this passage says? No, I believe Peter is saying that we can't let that fear paralyze us. We can't let that fear keep us from doing what is right. I want to um, read that little phrase again in the NIV. It says, if you do what is right and do not 
give way to fear, which means you don't let that fear take hold of you and determine how you act, how you respond. You stay faithful to the Lord. Okay, so if we continue reading in 1 Peter 3, look at verse 13 and verse 14. 13 and 14. If you look at 1 Peter 3, 13 and 14, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled because God is going to be with you. And what's most important is not the physical, but the spiritual. What's most important is not the now, but eternity. What's more important? Eternity, because our souls will live, live forever in eternity, either with God in heaven or in hell with the devil. And so Peter's trying to get his readers prepared for the coming trials. And we want to now look at verse 12. I know I'm doing it backwards of the way it's in your scripture. But look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God will help us in times of trouble. He hears our prayers. He hears our groanings and our pleadings and our laments. And he sees what's going on. Isn't it awesome that we serve such a God that is so big that he can know you intimately, know how many hairs are on your head, see everything that happens, hear every prayer that you utter, even if 10 million people are uttering a prayer at the same time, he can hear you. It's amazing. It is mind-boggling the awesome God that we serve. And what's more precious is that when you can feel his presence around you in you. I mean, that is pretty big. And to think that he is the creator of the universe and he cares for us who are so small and minute in comparison with the universe. It's awesome. Um, okay, so in verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears attend to their prayers. Is this how he took care of Sarah? Absolutely. Don't you think probably when Abraham said, Sarah, you pretend to be my sister, that maybe he was praying about it uh, when she got taken away? Maybe Sarah herself was praying about it. I don't know. But God saw what was happening. happening. He knew what was happening. And he took care of her. And I believe it's through this that he hears the prayers and he sees what's going, what we're going through. But even if Abraham didn't pray, because he was probably thinking about Seth a little bit too, God still is in control. So there you go. Absolutely. God still is in control. Yes. And he knew that Sarah is who he was going to have, who he had chosen to be the mother, the mother. of Isaac and yeah. through who the seed would come, yeah. etc. Nothing happens by accident. God has a plan for everything. Okay. So in the passages that we've read in 1 Peter 3 through verse 6, uh, Peter has been speaking to the wives. Now, Peter changes course a little bit, and in verse 7, he speaks to the husbands. So, 1 Peter 3, verse 7. He says, You husbands, and notice this little phrase, in the same way. Live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So in the same way, here he's been talking to the wives. He says, you have a responsibility. Now he goes to the husbands and he says, you also have a responsibility to treat your wife in a particular way. Um, when he was speaking to the wives and in our previous lessons, we've talked about how we as wives need to recognize that God made men and women for different roles. And because of that, he gave men and women different traits. 
right? And we mentioned, you know, men are more muscular and, and they're more determined and they're more aggressive. And that's all to help them be the leaders and to do the manual labor that they were asked to do by God. And he made women weaker uh, in our bodies. We don't have the upper physical strength that men have. But he made our hips wider so that we could give birth to children. Um, we are gentler. We, we, we talked about how when a child gets hurt, usually they run to mama because mama's more soothing and, and quieter and gentler. And so, but he's saying here, husbands, not only should the wives recognize these differences, but you husbands, you need to recognize that there's differences in your wife between you and her. They're, they're, God made you different. Okay, so he said, um, you recognize that she is the weaker vessel. You respect those differences that he put in her. Sometimes it's hard for us to look at um, the different traits that our husbands have or the husbands, the different traits that the wives have and look at that with respect. Sometimes it's like, man, that just gets on my nerves, right? <laughs> but God said, no, you look at that with respect and you treat her with respect. Show honor to her as a fellow Christian. You all don't share just in a physical relationship anymore. You are not just a husband and a wife. I am Roger's sister in Christ. He is my brother in Christ. We don't just share that physical bond of marriage. That's not the only bond that we share. We share that unity of spirit as brother and sister in Christ. And here he's telling these husbands that they need to recognize that. Because back in that day, a lot of wives were demeaned and they were considered as property. And they were considered as fulfilling a husband's sexual desires or fulfillment of his pleasure and also in creating male heirs. I recently read a book about um, Anne Boleyn. It was based on her life. Anne Boleyn was the second wife of King Henry VIII, okay? And as long as she was not married to King Henry and he was having to pursue her, he was madly in love with her. And then they got married and she miscarried a time or two. She had a daughter. She didn't have a son. When she had a son, she miscarried. And at that point, he had no use for her because what he wanted was a son, a son to carry on his, his hierarchy of uh, his kingship, you know, and to, um, and so women in that, in that scenario were just things to be used, you know. Um, I think it's particularly funny that now we know that the sex of a baby comes from the father. It has nothing to do with the mother. And so King Henry VIII had all these girls. It wasn't the mama's fault. It was him, but he didn't know that. And so what did he do with those women? He had their heads cut off. Oh, oh my mercy. She was the first. She, was, she had a lot of sway over him when, when she was in his good graces. And he was married to another woman, and she actually encouraged him to get that annulled. And so he became the head of the Protestant church in England. Um, they, they separated from the Catholic church, and he became head of the Protestant church in England. And then she wanted one of his um, advisors that she didn't get along with to, to be killed. And she is actually the one that kind of, started that will chop their heads off and then she ended up being the first and only well the first woman the first queen to have her head cut off but anyway send um, me to another harem we, <laughs> we digress but the point is the point is the bible rather than denigrating women rather than pushing women down like our uh, women's livers believe and would tell us it elevated women 
It elevated them. They were not just a piece of property anymore. They were brother and sister in Christ. They were helpers. They were partners. They were not just property to be owned. So God elevates women. Um, wives are companions and not just objects. I want us to turn now to Ephesians 5. Because Ephesians 5 talks about marriage. Verse 22 through verse 23 is what we're going to look at first in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. This is the part that speaks to the wife. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Now, I want us to notice verse 25, verse 28, and verse 33. Because these are the scriptures that speak to the husbands. Verse 25, Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 28. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. And verse 33, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Do you think it was an important thing that um, Paul had to write three times in this little letter in this little part of this letter for husbands love your wives verse 25 love your wives as christ loved the church verse 28 love your wives as you love yourself verse 33 love your wives as you love yourself so peter and paul and the gospel and jesus they all elevate women and and say to the husbands husbands you're no longer to have this wife as a piece of property, but you are to love her and treat her with respect. Um, so there's that. Now, I want us to go to 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. Because Peter says right here in this verse, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. So he's saying, first he spoke to the wives, then he spoke to the husbands, and now he says, to sum it all up, all, all of you, all of you Christians, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. What does it mean to be harmonious? Get along with one another. Get along with one another. Also, look with me at Romans 12 and verse 16. Romans 12 and verse 16. It means to get along with one another, but to get along with one another, you have to have a certain attitude. Romans 12 and verse 16. I'm not there yet, so uh, Lynn, read that for us, please. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Okay, be of the same mind. Do not be haughty in mind. Um, do you think that was appropriate for him to say to these people that he was writing to, Peter, do not be haughty, have the same mind? Because he's been talking about husbands and wives, and we saw where husbands may have had that attitude of the wife being a piece of property, and I'm better than she is, and she's just, you know, down here on the level of an animal or whatever. Be of the same mind. What about Jews and Gentiles? Did they get along with each other just naturally? No, they didn't. The Jewish people felt proud and considered the Gentile people as dogs. But now, as Christians, and we're coming together as a church, we have to be of the same mind. We have to not see uh, economic levels. We have to not see sex we have to not see uh, intellectual, you know, educational levels. What about in the church today? Can that be a problem with us today? Absolutely. Um, you know, James talks about if you have 
two people come into your assembly and one of them's rich and one of them's poor and you give the rich person a place of honor and the poor person you put him way off in the back corner somewhere where you don't have to see him smell him hear him look at him anything you're sinful you have sinned <coughs> so um yeah be of the same mind get along be harmonious the next uh thing he says is be sympathetic what does that mean be understanding mm -hmm. Walk in another's shoes. I've, I've recently seen on the internet, uh, on Facebook, a time or two, where it talks about um, that person who um, checked you out at the store, was a little bit short with you, might be having some really bad something in their life right now. And give them some grace. Or that person who was rushing you through traffic you know they may have a sick person that they're trying to get home to or whatever give them some grace in other words let's try to be sympathetic and walk in another person's shoes look at romans 12 this time verse 15. romans 12 verse 15. i should have told you to keep your bible turn to romans 12 but I didn't keep mine turned either. <laughs> Verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be sympathetic. Be sympathetic. Rejoice with those who have good things in their lives. And what would be the opposite of that would be being envious of them, right? And saying, well, I should have gotten that honor, not them or I deserve that, they didn't deserve that, or whatever. No, rejoice with them, be happy with them, and weep with those who weep. Okay, the third thing he says in, in our passage in 1 Peter 3, 8, um, is brotherly, be brotherly. Let me ask you a question. Does family, for the most part, does family take care of family? For the most part. For the most part, family takes care of family. Have you all heard some kind of expression like, well, you might call my brother a name and I'll beat you up on it, but I can call him a name and, you know, it's okay. Yeah. Or don't you call my sister a name or don't you hit my sister, you know, but, I you know. Do. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, because we're family, okay? So we realize that in the most natural families, that family stands up for family, and family takes care of family. Now, brothers and sisters are brothers and sisters in Christ. You are, in Christ, you are family. Our little congregation here in Adel, we should consider ourselves family, and we should act accordingly. Um, we should uh, see to each other's physical needs if there's a problem. You know, if somebody's hungry, we should make sure that they have something to eat. We should see to each other like um, if somebody is sick, um, trying to do what we can to help them, to visit them, to send cards, to encourage them. If somebody is discouraged, do what we can to lift them up. Um, it's like in Shelbyville, mom had her pacemaker and one of the ladies did not know that mom had someone to sit with my dad and she called my mom and she said, look, um, do you need for me to sit with Glenn? She said, I'm off that day and I would be so happy to come and sit with him. That's what being family is all about, taking care of family. Um, and if you'd like a verse for that, you can look at Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17. Proverbs 17, 17. And that reads, Proverbs 17, 17 reads, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Okay, so that's just saying that, you know, when you're having struggles, you can count on your brother. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ and should be able to count on each other. Okay, back in uh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 8, after brotherly, it says kind-hearted. 
And for this, I think kind-hearted is treat each other the way you want to be treated, not harshly. Do you want someone to yell at you when you do something wrong? No. You would rather they told you in a gentle manner, in a respectful manner. Do you want someone to yell back at you if you're a little bit upset and you raise your voice at them? Not really. Um, in other words, treat people the way you want to be treated, with kindness, gentleness, with grace, like I mentioned a minute ago, with grace. You know, maybe they've got something going on that's hard with them. I tell you what, that is really hard sometimes. Um, if Roger yells at me, what's my first instinct? Yell back. To yell back. When you were little, if you were on the playground and somebody hit you, what was you? What were you going to do? You're going to hit them back. And so we have to really work hard sometimes at loving our enemies, don't we? Loving our enemies, being kind-hearted. And then he goes on and he says, humble in spirit. And I believe humble in spirit is the opposite of being selfish. Would you agree? It's not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think, which we touched on that just a few minutes ago. But it's also the opposite of selfishness. It's thinking about the other person first. Look at Philippians 2 and verse 3 for me. Philippians 2 and verse 3. And this passage is my favorite passage. I just love this passage. It talks about Jesus. Philippians 2 and verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And one of the reasons that this verse speaks to me, I think, about being humble in spirit is because it says, don't do anything from selfishness or empty conceit. What does that mean? Vain. That means, empty means it's not valid, is it? It's not valid for you to um, think more highly of yourself. That's empty conceit. Um, God created us all. We all put our pants on one leg at a time, the saying goes. Um, and so, with humility of mind, think of others as more important than yourselves. And then this passage goes on to use Jesus as the example, and it's a beautiful passage. Um, so that's what it means to be daughters of Sarah if you do what is right and you live without that paralyzing fear that would stop you from doing what is right or that would just, um, just encourage you to do what is wrong or to do nothing at all. And it's our time is up, but I would encourage you as an ad addendum to this lesson to go to 1 Corinthians 13 and read the passage on love. But we'll close now and next week we will talk about what about the deaconess and um, our scriptures next week are Romans 16 and 1 Timothy 3. So next week that's what we'll do. But right now I will tell you um, I'm glad that you came and um, we had a good study and I hope you were encouraged by it just as I was. Okay. Thank you.